Thank you, Alexi, and uh, thank you guys for that intro. Um, of course, it's bull. Uh, the community, and uh, in particular, some of the really early researchers in industry and academia pioneered this space. Uh, in, and, and you know, I should shout out to Martin Odersky and the work he did on Scala, to the team at Berkeley, the work that they have done on Spark, and all the way back to the early days at Google, uh, Jeff Dean and the team there, uh, designing systems aimed at big data problems that were previously just absolutely intractable. Give me a minute here to set up, and I will kick off. Yep, that looks right. All right, so I want to talk to you today about Apache Spark, um, the most interesting processing and analytic platform we see in the big data ecosystem today. Uh, and I call it here the killer app for Scala. Uh, that may be a bit of a reach, in fact, Scala is used for a huge array of really interesting problems, but Spark is getting a ton of industry and academic attention right now, a very large and vibrant community. I want to talk a little bit about that project in the context of Scala, why we think it's so exciting, and uh, what we think the future holds. In order to do that, I want to start out, kind of orient the group. So, as you heard, I'm one of the founders of Cloudera. I've been working in big data now for, for eight or nine years. Um, when Google first invented the concepts behind Hadoop, the two key components they invented were the Google file system, really scale out storage, share a bunch of JBODs attached to a bunch of 1U rack mountable servers. Uh, so large scale distributed, robust, fault tolerant storage. That's a good thing. Uh, and on top of that, a processing framework that allowed you to push work out to where the data was. So fragment the data, store it in lots of different places. When you've got a question to ask, rather than suck all the data into one central location, you send the work out to all those little fragments. That was a really powerful and innovative idea. It had been tried before but we'd never seen it succeed at scale. And, and the reason was you couldn't actually buy and assemble large enough clusters at low enough prices to make that work. But in the early zeros, it turned out that rack-mounted storage and rack-mounted compute were getting uh, affordably priced, and you could take a whole bunch of older ideas and make them work in that context. MapReduce is a way to work with data. Uh, and one of the early knocks on Hadoop was that MapReduce sucked in a bunch of particulars. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But the failure of imagination at that time by people making that criticism wasn't believing that MapReduce was the way to work on data in parallel and at scale. In fact, if you think about it, you got this big distributed storage system and a whole bunch of processors right nearby all of those disks. You could imagine a whole bunch of different analytic and processing frameworks. Yeah, absolutely, MapReduce was a good one, but there are other ideas that have been in the literature for a long, to uh, long time. For example, massively parallel database systems. You could think of ways to parallelize uh, document indexing and search to design parallel machine learning and other frameworks. Over time, that's precisely what happened. So when we talk about Hadoop at Cloudera today, you know, we talk about that unlimited storage layer. Um, of course, it's an enterprise thing. You want it secure, you want it governed, you want it manageable. If the uh, regulators show up with a demand for information, you gotta be able to live up to that. So you need the kind of data governance infrastructure that large enterprises require. But most interestingly, across the top, there are lots of frameworks that you can now deploy in this world that allow you to work with your data. And that's why we think Spark is such a big deal. A little bit of remedial computer science for those of you in the room, though. So what is MapReduce? Well, look, key idea in this framework was, as I said, rather than bringing the data to the computation, you send the computation to the data. So you figure out where fragments of data live using the storage system's metadata. And then when you've got any, anal any analysis, any computation, any data processing job you want to do, you bust it into pieces and you send them out to the servers that have that data locally. The idea is that you map the tasks to the storage locations and you do your computation, then you combine your results 
and you reduce those results into a single result set that you can then use as the answer to whatever question was asked. And again, this is a pretty powerful framework. It had not been built and deployed successfully at scale. These ideas had been in the research literature for a long time, but nobody made it work reliably and at reasonable cost. It took advances basically in the server manufacturing sector to make that possible. So Google invented MapReduce and used it, first of all, Google used its massive ingest capability and that scale out storage system to ingest the entire internet. In 2000, it was doing that about twice a week. Now it does it continually, of course. Um, indexing that data relied on this framework. And by the way, when you go to Google and you run a search, you ask a question, you get a list of results back. When you click on the third result in the list, you're actually telling Google something very interesting about results one and two. Google would like to continually refine its search results based on that user feedback, and so it wanted to automate analysis of its logs as well. And they built that on this identical MapReduce framework. So it turned out to be a very flexible, very powerful way to attack data parallel problems, and it turns out a whole bunch of algorithms could be recast in this data parallel way. This was a big, big deal. This was magic that Google possessed, that Yahoo and Facebook and the rest of the uh, consumer internet actually feared. They worried that Google had an uh, unanswerable advantage. So when Google published its early papers, some of the early web uh, properties jumped on those ideas and created the open source Hadoop project. Powerful, transformative, as I said. A couple of drawbacks, right? One is, eh, you know, it's a new programming framework. You gotta learn a bunch of new programming abstractions. You've got to design to run in this new parallel model. Uh, oh, hey, by the way, it really helps if you're a hardcore Java programmer because the whole system is written in Java. And then there is MapReduce's dirty little secret. Its name should not be MapReduce. Its name should be Map Shuffle Reduce. That middle step right there where all the data moves around, that is the parking brake on performance in the system that Google built. That is forced synchronization. Nobody gets to go forward before everybody in the map stage has finished because the shuffle stage must reduce, must basically shuffle all of the results before you can declare victory. If you wanted to do computations that were pretty complex, if you wanted to design sort of multi-step analyses, every single step blocked until every processing engine was done. That is why you hear about these terrible map reduce latencies. You hear about these really long delays, these uh, batch mode interactions that people have. It's because synchronization requires everybody to finish. So powerful, transformative, but had a few drawbacks. Notwithstanding those drawbacks, it turned out that it could be used to attack a huge number of problems. So over time, Hive, a SQL parser that basically generated MapReduce jobs out the back end, Pig, a data flow language, a machine learning framework called Mahout, Crunch, Solar, a whole bunch of these new analytic and data uh, exploration tools got built on top of that identical framework. Um, I wrote a haiku to tell you that it's a bit like haiku. It is a really rigid framework. It requires you to recast problems in an exactly map reduced way. That notwithstanding, it was very diverse and very powerful. People liked the diversity and the power. People didn't like the latency, the complexity, the programmatic difficulty. Enter Apache Spark. So this research project uh, initiated at the University of California, Berkeley, um, was in some sense a response to MapReduce. So we've learned why this framework is really great. We've learned why this framework is not really great. We've learned what its problems are. How do we take those two large lessons and merge them to build a better follow-on system? Uh, I'm a Berkeley grad, so I'm always in favor of Berkeley technology. We're a sponsor of the AMP Lab where this work happened. Uh, and Matei Zaharia, uh, the student researcher, now MIT faculty member and Databricks founder, uh, who did this work, interned for us in 2010 and 2011. Uh, we were paying attention to Matei's work very, very early. 
Uh, we were excited about it, uh, and I'll come back to that story in a little bit. Um, we are very pleased to have seen this early research work bear fruit. So the code complexity, if you're building applications against Spark versus MapReduce, it's just easier. You're like half the code, 20% of the code required to do an equivalent amount of work, and it is an order of magnitude. Actually, that's not even a fair comparison. It is just vastly faster than MapReduce. Remember, I told you, if you wanted to do MapReduce work, you had to basically break your job down into a series of discrete steps, and then every step had to run to completion before the next step went. You forced synchronization everywhere in your execution graph. Well, Spark doesn't force you to do that. You can design any sort of directed acyclic computation executed in Spark, and the developer who knows where synchronization is required and where it's not inserts express synchronization points in the algorithm. The result is very high performance streaming, non-blocking computation, that plus another innovation. Remember what Google built was great storage, so good use of disk, and great parallel processing, so good use of CPUs. Google didn't really pay any attention to great use of memory. Spark absolutely does that. Allows you to do your analyses using local memory intelligently. Uh, that collection of innovations, a simpler API, general purpose DAG execution, no forced synchronization points, and wise use of memory. That's why Spark has totally taken the world by storm. It is a very good design based on the lessons that we learned. Uh, developers aren't forced to write only in uh, Java against Spark, there is high performance, there are high performance language bindings for sort of the next generation of very interesting languages. Now, now the system is built in Spark, so I'm sorry, in Scala. So of course, Scala interfaces are easy, uh, but the Scala interface is very well designed. Uh, likewise, data scientist popular languages, Python in particular, very well supported. You can still build Java applications that talk to your Spark infrastructure, so you don't have to cash in all of the development that you have done in the past against MapReduce. Um, but you've got now a choice of languages for building those applications that did not exist previously. And that's translated into interesting new use cases, stuff you simply wouldn't have done against MapReduce. Uh, big innovation is Spark Streaming, and you just heard about the importance of real-time and continuous data ingest and model retraining in order to deliver meaningful results. Turns out, with that non-blocking uh, architecture, with the ability to process data in memory at very high speed, uh, we see customers using this platform for continual data ingest and even alerting and complex event processing. On-the-fly ETL, watching for anomalous behavior, doing on-the-fly model retraining, uh, reporting summary metrics uh, as necessary without forcing the system to freeze and do that work. So Spark Streaming takes advantage of the architecture uh, that Spark provides in order to run well. Scala is the magic that makes that true. So first of all, very powerful, very expressive language. Uh, it was an excellent choice by the Spark team for the framework uh, that they developed. Um, inherent advantages for those developers building Scala applications against Spark. Um, Scala is an interesting language, and actually I had a very good dinner conversation last night about why this language is so popular among the most innovative developers that we see in the industry right now. Uh, and I'm not just sucking up to you guys because you chose to come to this conference. Functional programming has been a really interesting idea for a long time. Uh, back in the day, in the early 80s, uh, I learned Lisp because that was the language that we had. The idea of developing functional applications, not relying on side effects, was really intriguing. The ability to take advantage now of parallelism in ways that we couldn't previously eliminates some of the performance penalty that we paid back in the day. So it's now possible to develop really performant 
uh, functional algorithms uh, and run them well. Trick is, of course, that we need to train a generation or generations of programmers that are used to really procedural languages with variables and assignment and all the rest of that. We have to turn the, we, we have to teach them this new way of thinking. Those who have picked it up have fallen mad, crazy mad in love with us. So you can read the example here from Barclays. These folks are doing very high performance, scalable aggregation of business data across their customers, uh, allowing the bank and the user to make much better decisions about card usage, about investment decisions, about uh, fraud and risk scoring. Uh, absolutely transformative. So a little bit ago, I showed you that multi-framework picture, right? It started out just Google file system and MapReduce, and then over time, these other engines crept in. Where do we see Spark happening uh, in this ecosystem? First thing to note is when you're Google, when you invented this platform some years ago, you had that single execution engine running on top. You didn't really need to worry about, uh, about resource allocation and about isolation and about uh, managing competing engines that are trying to go after different amounts of memory and disk and so on. Uh, no longer true. When you've got Impala for high performance SQL paired with MapReduce and also Search and Mahout and now a variety of workloads running in Spark, you want to be able to allocate compute, storage, memory and so on reasonably. So you need Yarn, the new resource management layer. Uh, that's got to underlie all of these engines. We've seen Spark take its place as a meaningful alternative to MapReduce. Uh, and I'll tell you, my belief is that the fraction of new workloads running on MapReduce is going to decrease dramatically. Now, I want to be careful. That doesn't mean that MapReduce is going to go away. There are many, many, many very large applications running on MapReduce around the world today. Uh, think about mainframes. Think about COBOL. Systems like that don't die. In fact, systems like that are very well designed for a specific class of problems. But the advantages I talked about before, right? Performance, lack of blocking, very low latency, and most of all, the ease with which developers can use Spark mean that it's a much more attractive option. We're seeing work that would have gone into uh, MapReduce applications now being done on Spark. Point of fact, I talked about a number of engines that run on Spark, say uh, on MapReduce, Crunch and, and Hive and Pig. The community is porting all of those now to run on Spark instead. So those higher level languages running on that general purpose MapReduce framework are going to perform much better and deliver much better results because they're being ported to this new framework. Uh, we've got lots of customers. I'll talk in just a minute about where we see adoption happening embracing this hybrid infrastructure. When we talk about Hadoop today, this is actually what we mean, not MapReduce and HDFS, but a collection of processing frameworks, Search, Impala, MapReduce, Spark, and Friends, running on a shared resource management framework with a few different storage alternatives underneath. We buttress it with the kind of manageability and data governance that I talked about. But this platform looks very little like what Yahoo was running in 2008. And that's not surprising. Big data matters to a whole bunch of different uh, industries and, and customers. And it has evolved to take on workloads that would previously have been impossible. So let me give you a quick overview of how we progressed through this, uh, through this uh, uh, pathway. So I told you that we began paying attention to Spark when Matei was doing his early work uh, still as a Berkeley doctoral student. In 2013, we actually recognized the utility of Spark in the context of MapReduce. And I posted a pretty controversial blog post on the Cloudera blog, basically asserting that Spark would replace MapReduce as the general purpose uh, processing engine for new workloads in the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, at the time, a lot of people uh, screamed and yelled. In fact, now uh, IBM, I guess, has announced that they're going to go hire a few thousand Spark developers and train a million Spark professionals. Uh, Databricks has launched and gotten funded substantially. Hortonworks, MapR have all embraced Spark as well. I, I, I will claim we spotted this and announced this before the rest of the industry did, but it was pretty obvious if you were paying attention to why big data mattered, what was going to happen. 
Uh, so we shipped in 4.4 4 in 2014. We began doing some pretty substantial contribution, in integrating with the rest of the framework. So it's not merely data analysis and processing that's interesting. You have to think about the data on which you're working. What constraints apply to that data? Who's allowed to see different values? Have you got a robust security infrastructure? If the system goes down, do you have demonstrated ability to fail over to a remote site? Are, are you able to manage enterprise level uh, availability guarantees? So we've spent a lot of time working with the global Spark community to make that happen. Uh, and then promoting, right? So Cloudera University, we've got training, uh, we've been driving those kind of enterprise requirements, promoting Spark as an analytic platform uh, with O'Reilly's uh, data science book series and more. Uh, the folks at TypeSafe and Databricks ran a survey recently, basically scoring the different companies in the industry. Uh, and I'm super pleased with uh, folks using uh, the um, Cloudera CDH distribution to manage their Spark infrastructure. So we've got a, a whole bunch of users doing that. Um, we've got uh, more than, uh, I'm sorry, I thought I missed, well, no, let me just keep going. Um, we've got a big strategic partnership with Intel. We're plowing uh, jointly a fair, to bit, a fair bit of engineering payroll into innovation on the platform uh, and again working with the global community to drive its evolution. Um, we're concentrating on areas where we think we've got a real differentiated ability to make the product better. So enterprise ready because that's who we sell to, right? Large banks, hospitals, insurance companies where data privacy, data reliability, regulatory uh, restraints matter. Um, we're working very hard with the community to port those old uh, processing engines, Scoop and Crunch and Hive and Pig and so on, to the new system. Performance, even though it is vastly faster than MapReduce, it is not fast enough, so we're continuing to drive that. Um, and we're driving SQL innovation on the platform in the context of our investments in SQL generally. Finally, uh, we're doing a lot of work on data science, including uh, we just announced recently a new open source project, IBIS, uh, aimed at basically making Python for data scientists much more robust and able to communicate with the different processing engines under the covers. More than 200 of our enterprise customers are running the platform now. Uh, 800 node Spark cluster is a pretty monstrous computational capacity if you think about it. And we see it being used in a huge range of workloads. Many of these continual data analysis, on the fly model retraining, real time data service, stuff that Google didn't conceive of when it thought about MapReduce back in the day. Uh, we absolutely offer some ways for those of you who want to learn more about Spark in particular. Uh, if you hit the Cloudera booth out here, I think we've got copies of the Spark book available. Um, Cloudera Live is an online resource you can go to, just fire up, spins up an instance uh, on the Amazon Cloud, uh, and uh, or, well, I'm sorry, uh, on a number of public cloud providers. I want to be careful which ones I'm allowed to announce. Um, and you can try out Spark there without uh, having to install it locally. And we've got a bunch of training classes. Um, I've raced a little bit because I want to be respectful of the conference time. Um, we are even more bullish today on Spark in the big data ecosystem than before. It's the next natural step for the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, I'm super excited at the work that the global community is doing. And for those of you here in the room who have been involved in driving the Spark platform forward in Scala, thank you. Uh, it's made a big difference to us. Thank you all for listening.